Today we're continuing a, a series through the Lord's Prayer entitled Thy Kingdom Come, which is part of a longer journey through the entirety of Jesus teaching us through what we call the Sermon on the Mount. As we opened up this series, we said that when you pray, you don't manipulate God with what you say, but you speak from the heart, but you do that in an ongoing way. Prayer is a, is a practice that we engage in regularly. That when we pray, we call God Father, so prayer is a place where we find intimacy with our Father. Prayer is a place where we find our Father to be a refuge and a strength, and our Father is also a place where we are formed and we learn from Him. That we pray that God's name, which is not separate from God Himself, His name would be known and worshipped because in God's name there is life. We saw that we are praying for a kingdom that was expected, a kingdom that was brought and inaugurated by the Lord Jesus that continues on today and then will be brought to completion when Jesus returns. We saw that if God's will is to be done, God's will is done through and in the Messiah. And so God's will begins, is done by beginning by faith in the Messiah, by conformity to Him, to be made like Him and to live in obedience to Him. Then last week, we saw that uh, God invites us, Jesus invites us to pray for our daily bread, and that bread is daily physical sustenance, but also daily spiritual sustenance, as Jesus is the bread of life. And that as we receive and are blessed by God by sustaining us physically and spiritually, then we become conduits of grace and extend that same blessing to others. So today we'll be looking at the next petition that Jesus invites us to pray in the Lord's Prayer, which is found in Matthew 6. I invite you to stand as we read this together. And uh, unlike what we've been doing, we are going to add the two verses that conclude the Lord's Prayer, which are verses 14 and 15. I think when we get there, you'll see why. So I'll begin with the first phrase, and if you would join me as we say together the Lord's Prayer at Our Father. This, then, is how you should pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. And though the grass withers and the flower fades, the word of our Lord remains forever. Please be seated. Let's ask the Lord's blessing. Heavenly Father, we pray your blessing on our time together in the Word. Pray your blessing on our reading and in our hearing. We pray, Lord, that because of your Spirit, we'd be blessed. And it's doing, not simply being hearers of the Word, but doers. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we have done in the past few weeks, we'd love for us to begin our time talking about prayer by saying a prayer together a prayer that uh, will help set our trajectory of where we'll be headed in today's message. So I'll put it up on the screen and would love for us to say this all together. If you would join me in saying, Gracious Heavenly Father, I am a sinner and need to be forgiven every day. I know I don't deserve your forgiveness, and so I have no right to withhold it from anyone. Give me the strength to let go of any offense against me. Have mercy on me and forgive me, that I may delight in your will, walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. Well, of course, there are no coincidences and accidents with God, and uh, one of the advantages of being a preacher is that uh, it's a privilege, really. I get to, for me, I spend all week 
in one passage and really let that passage soak and, and uh, to meditate for an extended period of time personally. And I'm sure you do that in your own prayer times in different areas of Scripture. But um, this week, I, I just realized something about myself. I, I, I always considered myself to be very quick to forgive and I think generally, generally am. Uh, but I also realized this week that I can also be one to hold on to uh, offense and bitterness, <laughs> particularly when it's not something that's done against me, when something does somebody against someone else that I care about. Uh, I realized this week in my time that that's not something I let go of very quickly, and I needed to spend some time, and I hope that uh, I learned and, and the Lord helped me, and I hope that today might be somewhat of a help to you. So just a few things about forgiveness as we move forward. Uh, forgiveness can take different forms, at least two. That is, forgiveness can be unilateral, and forgiveness can be transactional. Unilateral forgiveness, or una meaning one way, is forgiveness that's offered but isn't necessarily received. And that can be for all kinds of reasons, maybe because uh, the person who's offended you hasn't asked for forgiveness. Uh, do you have to wait for someone to ask for it before you extend it? And the answer would be no. We, we, we forgive because we're forgiven. And so that kind of forgiveness would be unilateral forgiveness one way. Sometimes uh, someone does not ask for forgiveness because they don't think they've done anything wrong. Yet you've been offended. Or maybe uh, somebody's done something to you a long time ago and you no longer know that person, or that person's so far outside of your life now that there's no way that you could contact them. So how, can you offer forgiveness then? Well, that's going to look like unilateral forgiveness. Or maybe somebody's done something to you, and that person is no longer alive. They've died. And they're certainly not going to ask for forgiveness in that case. So it, can you still forgive? Yes, of course you can forgive, but it's going to look like unilateral forgiveness. Now, the other being transactional, transactional forgiveness would be between two parties where one person is asking for forgiveness, the other person is giving forgiveness that is then received, and then that leads towards reconciliation. So reconciliation doesn't happen without forgiveness, but you can have forgiveness that does not lead to reconciliation. So forgiveness can look different different times. Also, I want to make sure to say at the outset that I want to make sure that I hope comes through the message as we move, is I am not suggesting that forgiveness is easy. Forgiveness is not like a light switch in your house where you just turn it on and off. People really have hurt us. Forgiveness is not saying, hey, what you did to me, like, doesn't matter. Uh, it doesn't mean that you pretend like you don't feel pain, that you haven't been hurt. That, that's not what forgiveness is. So it's difficult, but I hope that we see with the words of the Lord Jesus, it is necessary in the Christian life. There are two different Greek words that are translated into English as forgiveness. One of them I'll just mention, the other one we're going to look a lot more deeply at because it's the word that Jesus uses in the Lord's Prayer. One of the Greek words that's used to translate forgiveness which is the word that's used in Ephesians 4, where it says, forgive one another just as God in Christ has forgiven you. Now, that word translated into English as forgiveness is the Greek word charizomai, and that word means to give a gift. And the practice of forgiveness is the practice of gift giving. You are giving a gift, and when someone forgives you, you're receiving a gift from them. So forgiveness has a, a gift giving kind of a sense. The other Greek word that's used and then translated into English as forgiveness is the Greek word aphiomi. Now, the Greek word aphiomi, also translated as forgiveness, means to release someone or to release something, to set something free, to cancel something. And we can see in the language of the Lord's Prayer that this is the Greek word that Jesus uses. And, you can, and within the construction of the Lord's Prayer, it says, forgive us our what? Debts. Release us from our debts. Forgive us of our debts. Give us the freedom. Set us free from our debts. Cancel our debts. That's, the, that's what this word to forgive means. As we also set free, release, cancel 
those that have debts against us. So what I would like to do today is to see where does Jesus get this language of releasing debts? To say that Jesus is not speaking into a vacuum. Jesus was drawing this language from within the deep well of the Hebrew Scriptures that then gets developed through the Hebrew Scriptures into Jesus himself and then to see how does this apply to us. But where is Jesus getting this language of forgiveness in terms of releasing? Where does this come from? And it comes from the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, the people of Israel would celebrate seven yearly festivals. Three of them in the first six months of the year, three of them in the second six months of the year. There was one festival, however, that was celebrated more than once a year. In fact, it was a festival that was celebrated once a week. And this is called the Sabbath. The Sabbath, which was celebrated from Friday night until Saturday night, was God's invitation to his people to experience the Sabbath rest that was enjoyed by Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden in God's eternal seventh day. So once a week, the people were to embody and enact the rest that was enjoyed by Adam and Eve, which was then to look forward to the eternal rest that they would enjoy forever with God, the new creation that he was bringing. But they lived that out once a week, which is a beautiful gift. Now, the Sabbath was also expanded within the Old Testament. And so you would have a Sabbath once a week, but you'd also have what was called a Sabbath year. So once every seven years, there would be a Sabbath year. And in the Sabbath year, you would not cultivate your fields. And the fields would then be available for wild animals, for the poor, and then for yourself as well. And they would all kind of commonly share with what the land produced. It was also a release from debts and a release of slaves. So that was kind of a Sabbath year. Then there was kind of a Sabbath year. is like a super Sabbath. You know, Sabbath once a month, super Sabbath once a year. Then there's like the super, super, duper, super Sabbath. And that is described in a place in the Old Testament in Leviticus, our favorite book in the Bible. (laughs) Actually, to be quite serious, once you really understand Leviticus, it is a tremendous book. It is a beautiful book when you really understand it. I'm not saying I totally do, but it's a wonderful book. In Leviticus 25, we read about this super-duper, super-awesome Sabbath. And here's how it's described. Count off seven Sabbath years. Notice we said it was the super Sabbath. Seven times seven years. So the number seven is important. So that the seven Sabbath years amount to a period of 49 years. So you have seven times seven, 49 years. Then on the Day of Atonement, and there's probably no accident that this fest, this super-duper, super Sabbath, Uh, begins on the Day of Atonement, which is of the forgiveness of sins, sound the trumpet, this is great, we love that, throughout your land, and consecrate the 50th year as a super-duper, super-awesome Sabbath. Doesn't say that, but it's implied. So you consecrate the 50th year, and here's, you proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. This is called the Jubilee Year. The year of Jubilee. Remember we sing that song, the year of Jubilee? I don't know what's happening, all the motions that we do and everything. <laughs> this is the Jubilee. Now, the Jubilee was a tremendous event in the nation of Israel. The Jubilee would be the cancellation of all debts, the release of slaves, and the return of every Israelite to their land. So regardless of what had happened during in between the two Jubilee years, if you had to sell your land because you were impoverished and you had to do that, you would get your land back. You just go back, now it's yours. It was a huge celebration of deliverance, of release, freedom. In a way, what it was like was when I grew up, at least in the, the 80s and 90s, I used to play Super Nintendo, the Nintendo system. And, and the Nintendo system had two buttons a power button and a reset button. The Jubilee is a gigantic reset button for the nation of Israel. Because if you were playing a a, a video game, right? I'm playing whatever, Mario Brothers, you know. I could be playing that game and no matter what level I got to, right at the end, if my brother came up and pushed the reset button, what happened? I'm right back at the beginning. And that's what, this was a giant reset button for the nation of Israel 
once every 50 years, on the 50th year. Now, this concept of jubilee was picked up through the Hebrew Scriptures and developed and, and described. It was described in, the, in Ezekiel, it's talked about in Jeremiah, and it's talked about in Isaiah. And I want to read from uh, Isaiah for you a jubilee text, a text that is de describing jubilee. Now, there is a bit of a development, and I want you to see here the development that happens in Isaiah over what was happening in Leviticus in the, the description of jubilee. This comes from Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and to release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, when you read the year of the Lord's favor, that is the Jubilee. This is a Jubilee text. Can you see why the Jubilee is good news for the poor? If you had all this credit card debt that you couldn't pay back, guess what? Jubilee is the best year of your life. Now, the development here is how is this Jubilee going to be announced? Who is going to initiate the Jubilee? In Leviticus 25, what initiates the Jubilee? A trumpet on the calendar, right? It was a trumpet that was initiated on the 49th year on the Day of Atonement, which was day 10, month 7. But here in Isaiah, what's announcing and enacting, what's initiating Jubilee? An individual anointed. Now, that word anointed is what it means to be a king. A king is anointed. The word anointed into Greek is the word Christos, which is the word we say Christ. So this anointed king is going to be the one who has the Spirit of the Lord upon him who is going to announce the Jubilee. And because of his announcements, the Jubilee will be enacted. Yes? Let's look into Jesus. In all three synoptic Gospels, which is Matthew, Mark, and Luke, in the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he is baptized by John the Baptist. And as he comes out of the water, what descends upon him, right? The heavens are torn open and a dove comes down, which is the Holy Spirit. Comes down and anoints Jesus. He's anointed there. He's uh, given the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit. And what happens next? What happens next after his baptism? Where does he go? He's driven into the wilderness. He's there for 40 days, being tempted by the evil one. Now, unlike the Israelites, who are tempted for 40 years in the wilderness, and I'm right now in my own reading in the book of Numbers, they, do, they, do they succeed or fail? They fail, right? They fail. They, they, they will, Israel doesn't do well in the wilderness temptations in their time in the wilderness. But how long were they in the wilderness? 40 years. How long is Jesus in the wilderness? 40 days. Now, that's not an, uh, that's not an accident. Because Jesus is the embodiment of the people. Jesus is Israel. Jesus is the embodiment of Israel. Now, does Jesus succeed in his wilderness temptations? Yes. yes. So after he succeeds, where Israel fails, where does he go next? Where does he go next? In Luke's gospel, he goes home. Where is home? Nazareth. Where is Nazareth? It's in Galilee. Where is Galilee? Above Jerusalem. So, you know, you know where uh, uh, the southern kingdom of Israel was. You know, he had to go up Samaria, up through Samaria, up to Galilee. So he goes up to Galilee, back to Nazareth, back home. Hometown boy going home. How big is Nazareth? Big or small? Small. About a thousand people probably lived in the time of Jesus' day. He goes back home. Now, when he goes home, on the Sabbath, he goes to synagogue. And he was well known at this time. You know, he would have been a teacher, recognized for his teaching. And so when he comes into synagogue, hometown boy, man, he's, he's like the, you know, the star basketball player from the high school team that comes home. Hey, shoot some baskets for us. Or so, you know, he, he was, well, he was a hometown boy. Hey, great. Let's have him teach for us at the synagogue. So he comes home. He's not the first reader. In the synagogue, you'd have two readings. 
The first reading would be from the Torah. That wasn't Jesus. So they had somebody else that morning read from the Torah and would have sat down to give a teaching. And then Jesus was the second reader. So that's what usually the second reading was done by reading out one of the prophets. That's why they always talk about in the New Testament the law and the prophets, synagogue reading. So he, he has the second reading. And Jesus then stands up to, to give the second reading, and he's handed the Isaiah scroll. And he opens it up and reads it. What does he read? Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free and to proclaim the year, the Jubilee of the Lord's favor. Jesus reads the Jubilee text. Then what does Jesus do? He says he rolled up the scroll, he gave it back to the attendant and he sat down and everybody was looking at him. Why were they looking at him? Were they looking at him because he wrote the Jubilee text? No. They're looking at him because they're waiting for him to teach. So when a person would give a reading, they would stand to do the reading, and then when they would teach, they would sit down. So unlike today, where we make the preachers stand and everyone else gets to sit. <laughs> Back in Jesus' day, the teacher would sit. So Jesus sits, and so they're waiting for him to give a teaching. Now, what does he say? Now, this is the shocking thing. Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. If there's ever a time where Jesus could have done a mic drop, <laughs> you know, this is it. This was shocking. What was Jesus saying? This is fulfilled in your hearing? Jesus is saying, you can see why these people could have had such a problem with this. This is the hometown kid. We know your dad, mom, and brothers and sisters. You fulfill this? Jesus is saying, I am that anointed Messiah. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me. I am that figure. And I am here to proclaim what? Jubilee. I am the messianic king. And jubilee will be initiated in me. I am the one to proclaim the afiami. Let's look back at that text. That's the word that's used. Remember, afiami means to release or to forgive. He has sent me to proclaim afiami. Maybe you would think forgiveness. He has sent me to proclaim forgiveness for the prisoners, but no, the freedom, because that's what forgiveness is. It's a release. It's a freedom. He has sent me to afiami to proclaim a fiami for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind and to set the oppressed a fiami. It's the same word that Jesus uses in the Sermon on the Mount in the Lord's Prayer. To set free, that's what Jesus does. And through Jesus' ministry, he is proclaiming and enacting the jubilee in what he's doing. And he is explaining jubilee now through his ministry in terms of the forgiveness of sins. And I want to show that to you in a, in a more extended passage in Matthew 18. Because in Matthew 18, Jesus begins to talk about what it means that he is the jubilee, that he is the messianic king that's initiating the jubilee for God's people. The release, the reset button is being pushed. So in this passage of Scripture, the uh, disciple Peter it's coming to Jesus and asking about forgiveness. And he asks a question that probably at some point you and I have asked, or certainly maybe one of our kids have asked of us, or kids you've asked your parents, or whatever. Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? How long do, how many times do I got to do this before I've kind of reached the quota? If I, if I, you, you've lied to me and I've forgiven you these six times, so I have to keep forgiving you? You keep lying. You, you, you keep pushing me. How many times do I have to keep doing it? You stole my ball. You, how many times do I have to keep forgiving you? How many times? Should I? Maybe seven? Seven sounds like a good number, right? Number of completion should be good. Jesus answers, I tell you, not seven times. Seventy times seven times. What does that sound like? Seventy times seven. Jubilee. It's a jubilee kind of number. And then he tells a story. He says, this is, 
to kind of get to you how, this, how we understand forgiveness, here's how, let me tell you a story to help you understand. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began to settle, a man owed him 10,000 bags of gold. This amount of money, and I'm sure if you've ever heard this passage preached, you know, he cannot pay this back. It's beyond his capacity. In this lifetime, or probably 10 lifetimes, he's, he's not paying this back. But since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees. Be patient with me, he begged. I will pay back everything. Could the servant pay back everything? No. But he's saying, have mercy on me. Have pity on me. And it says the servant's master took pity on him and what? canceled the debt. You know what the word that's used there? Afiami. He canceled it. He released him from the debt. He set him free from the debt. He forgave him the debt and let him go. This is a picture of God's forgiveness for you and for me. You owe God a debt that you cannot pay. And God afiamis you. He cancels it. He forgives it. He releases you from it. He sets you free from it. Notice what the master does not do. The master does not say, I look, I know that you can't pay me, but how much can you pay me? Maybe we'll put you on a payment plan for the rest of your life. This last year, uh, we had a baby girl, Dahlia, and uh, when you have babies, babies aren't free. <laughs> you start making some money back at tax time, which is nice. But, uh, when you have a baby in a hospital, that ain't free. I don't know what they put in those beds. It ain't free. And that food ain't that good. I don't know why it costs so much, but anyway. So when you have, you know, any, not just for babies, any stay in the hospital, right? Eventually, you know, what, what's coming? Your bill. And we open it up, you go, oh, I was just there for 24 hours. What was going on? But you get this bill. And so I, we got a bill for Dahlia, right? And uh, we're, we're blessed beyond belief to have her, but there's this bill. And, uh, so that's not a bill we could pay. So we call the hospital. And we say, here's the deal. We can't pay this. What do they say? No problem. We'll put you on a payment plan which we are on, and every month we are paying it. But I wonder sometimes, when we think about forgiveness, we put people on payment plans. I think what we might call that is holding a grudge. A grudge is just a payment plan. Yeah, 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 pay me a little bit off at a time. You'll never get to the end of it. But if you prove yourself to me, Maybe I'll hate you a little less next year. Just keep paying me. That's not what the master does to the servant. There's no payment plan. He affirms the debt. He cancels it. He sets him free, completely free. And that's what Jesus has done to you. You are completely free in Christ. Your debt is gone. He has forgiven your debt, a debt you could never pay, ever. 10,000 bags of gold, debt gone just because I decided I don't want to have you pay it. Then Jesus starts talking about, well, what about when we react with each other? Okay, we talked about my relationship with God, my 10,000 bags of gold I can't pay. God, a fee of me is that debt. I'm set free. He says, but when that servant went out, the one who's been forgiven, the one who's had his debt canceled, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 silver coins. That's nothing compared to 10,000 bags of gold. Nothing. He grabbed him and he began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell on his knees, and this is like a replay right here. Be patient, I'll pay you back. But the servant refused. And said he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. Now, when the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and they went and told the master. And the master called the servant in. And he says, you wicked servant. I afiamid all that debt. 
I set you free. I canceled it. Because you begged me. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just like I had on you? And it says, in anger, his master handed him over to the jailer to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. And then Jesus says something that should frighten you and frighten me. Jesus, this is frightening. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you. This is the Bible. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you. Unless you forgive, unless you afia me, unless you release and set free and cancel the debt of your brother or sister from your heart. So what's happening here is, is the servant goes to the master who owes, he owes 10,000, 10, how many bags of gold was it? 10,000 bags of gold. It's this crazy amount. And what the, what the servant says is like, please, master, please don't ask for justice. Do not give me justice. Because if that servant gets justice, he's done for. Don't give me justice. And each one of you should be begging God, don't give me justice. Amen. You do not want justice from God. And so the master doesn't give him justice. Praise the Lord. He isn't simply merciful to him. He's gracious to him. He extends way beyond what he deserves. He's like super awesome gracious to him. He cancels the debt. But then here's the deal. The servant then goes, and this is like between you and I, not just you and I, but between interpersonal relationships, right, between each one of us. And the servant, the person who owed the money, the, the, the hundred silver coin says, give me mercy. And the servant says, no, I demand what? Justice. I demand justice. Give me what you owe me. And the servant, the master then goes to the servant and says, you want justice? You'll get it. You ain't going to like it. We don't want justice from God. And what Jesus is saying, don't go around demanding justice from others. We are to be a people that are marked by mercy and grace. We have received grace upon grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. And we are to be a people who extends grace upon grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. Because they deserve it. Do you deserve it? Not because they deserve it, but because you've received it. So as we close, I want to give a quick example or, that I think can help us paint a picture of what, what does this actually look like? How can we actually do this? Because I am not saying this is easy. This comes from the book of Philemon, this example. Philemon's Paul's shortest letter. He's written to a man named Philemon who lived in Colossae. So this letter probably would have accompanied the letter that we call the letter of the Colossians. So it would have come together. And Paul is in the book of Philemon attempting to bring reconciliation between two parties. Philemon and his runaway slave, whose name is Onesimus. And to run away as a slave, of course, was wrong. But it's likely that Onesimus, when he ran away, didn't simply just run away. He probably did more than that. He probably stole, stole money. Probably maybe even more than that. We don't, it doesn't say, but he did something that was really offensive. And, and so he was a slave, stole from Philemon, and ran away. And here's Paul writing this letter to bring them back together again in reconciliation. And I want to show you what the Apostle Paul says and how this can be instructive for us. Here's what Paul says. Welcome Onesimus as you would welcome me. If he has done you anything that's wrong or owes you anything, if, you have a, if he has a debt to you, 
charge it to me. I will pay it back. Not to mention that you owe me your very self. So if we read this in reverse, I think this is instructive. That he begins by saying, you, because what Paul's doing really is, is standing in an analogous way to Jesus. He's acting in a Christ kind of position. So I think we can start at the back and say, not to mention that you owe me your very self. The Bible says that you have been bought with a price. Therefore, you are not your own, but you belong to God. You are his possession. He's bought you. He is the one that has paid your 10,000 bags of gold debt. So if we're going to enter into forgiveness, we have to start there. You have to start by saying, I have been forgiven 10,000 bags of gold of debt. I have been forgiven a debt I could not pay. Which is why Jesus says, forgive us today our daily, you know, forgive us our debts. We start with that. And whenever you work with forgiveness, if you forget that you have been forgiven a debt that you could not repay, good luck with forgiveness. You have to start there. You have been forgiven. And then he says, look, I also know that this guy Onesimus has done something against you. And I am not telling you that it's nothing. I'm not saying forget about it. I'm not saying it doesn't matter. What I am saying is that the debt that he owes you is like 100 silver coins. And I want you, Philemon, to take those 100 silver coins, which are real. This is a real debt. This is real offense. This is real pain. I want you to take those 100 silver coins, and I want you to give them to me. And then I want you to treat him like he doesn't deserve. Because how does God treat us? Does God treat us as our sins deserve? Praise God, no. The Bible says God does treat you not as your sin deserves. He treats you as you're not as that. He, he doesn't treat you as your sins deserve. So right now in this moment, I want you to think as we close. I want you to picture it with your eyes closed or just even your mind's eye, a face of someone that's offended you. Uh, or, or a name, or, or even just a feeling or a situation, something that you're going like, you know, this is something that I, I have a difficult time forgiving. Or here's someone that's, uh, that's done something against me. Does everybody have something? Now, I want you to, as you think about that, I want you to start with this thought. I have been forgiven by God 10,000 bags of gold. I have been forgiven a debt. There is no way I could ever repay, but it's been forgiven. And now, thinking about that person, I want you to think about what that person has done to you as being like 100 silver coins. It's not nothing. It's real pain. It's real offense. And I want you to take in your mind's eye those hundred silver coins, which is nothing compared to 10,000 bags of gold. And I want you to take those hundred silver coins, and in your mind, I want you to take those and give them to Christ. This is offense. I give it to you. That's why Jesus says, it's mine to repay, says the Lord. Mine to repay. Give it to Christ. And now in your mind's eye, I want you to think about, if, especially if it's a person, I want you to think about the next time you see that person. It might be the person next to you, I don't know. And I want you to imagine in your mind's eye greeting that person the next time you see them in a way they don't deserve. What does that look like? What does it mean for you to treat that person like they don't deserve? But you're enabled to do that because you've been forgiven 10,000 bags of gold. And you've taken that 100 silver coins and you've given them to Christ. So now you're able to treat them like they don't deserve because you're treated like you don't deserve. And I wonder the next time you can open your eyes, the next time you see that person, I wonder how you're going to treat them. Because Jesus says, you've been forgiven. It's jubilee, people. It's jubilee. You've been released of your 10,000 bags of gold. It's time to bring Jesus 100 silver coins. And it's time for us to be the ones that proclaim as the hands and feet of Jesus 
the prisoners have been set free. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the forgiveness that we have in Christ. That Jesus, the Messiah, the anointed King, empowered by the Holy Spirit, proclaims good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, to set the prisoners free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. The Jubilee is now. And we pray, Lord, that as we have been given grace upon grace upon grace, that we would extend that same grace as we cancel the debts of others in demonstration of our own debt being canceled. And Lord, I pray that just as you do not treat us as our sins deserve, I pray for each person here, myself first, that when I interact with those who have things against us, I will not treat them as their sins deserve because I've taken their hundred silver coins. I've canceled that debt and given it to Christ. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.